It's something else altogether, though, to admit that we need the Lord when things are going well. Um, and probably we need him more when things are going well, because being what we are, who we are, we tend to forget just how much we do need him and how much he has done for us. We need the Lord every single day, 24-7, and we need to remember that. Let's sing, Lord, I need you. of the time. But Father, in your grace and in your mercy, you are there with us, whether we acknowledge you or not, whether we admit how much we need you. Father, work in each one of our lives to make us so aware of your presence, to make us so aware, Father, of our inadequacies, our inabilities to live the way you want us to. Father, in your word, you tell us to be filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to make that a priority of our days, to ask you each day, Lord, to fill us so that we can live for you, so that we can accomplish the things you want us to. 
And Father, above all, so that we will be aware more and more of your presence. Lord, we thank you for all this. For it's in your son's name we pray, Lord. Amen. It's interesting how we handle our emotions when we're happy or when we have an unexpected surprise that is good. We bubble with joy. We can't contain our joy. We tell everyone. We pick up the phone. Have you heard? Let me tell you. And we just want to give that joy to everyone. The contrast, opposite side of that, we're talking about fear. Some of us are too macho to express the fact that we're afraid or even give that as the reason of why we will or will not do certain things. But fear is such a force, which you've seen last week, that it controls the way we think, the way we live. It controls our reactions. It either holds us back from relationships or we make wrong decisions because of fear. Fear shuts you down. That's why when we see someone that's upset, they may be afraid, they're quiet. And we ask them, what's wrong? Oh, nothing. And there's that kind of fear that's even so strong between husband and wife of the things that you cannot talk about. Because if you talk about, you recognize that they're real. Such as years ago, when I mentioned this to you, when, uh, when our younger son was sick and the doctor came in the, in, the, in the office and he said, his white blood count cells is low. We looked at each other and we could not name it. And we were praying, but we were afraid. How do you deal with this fear that really matters in life? Is Scripture strong enough? Does God really care? Can God handle those fears that seems to be life-ending? I've said this to my wife many times, that she deserves not just a medal, but a statue for all those times that she dealt with sitting on the sideline and praying as she was fearing that I would die. One of those times which I may or may not have mentioned to you actually puts us in the picture of how we should handle those things that are life-threatening and how we should give them to God or not. So we were in Hawaii, and my son and I, the youngest one, we, we went for a scuba dive offshore. So we swam out about a half a mile to a mile. We dove, we swam, we saw everything we loved, we came up. Now it's time to swim back. We did not take into consideration the, uh, the tide that was going out in the afternoon. And that's what the time it was. So we got up and we began to swim backwards towards the, towards, towards the shore. Every once in a while I would look back to make sure we're still going towards the island. But most of the time I, I was looking forward. I was looking towards the sky. So as we are swimming and swimming and swimming and swimming, 45 minutes of swimming, we're not getting any closer. She saw what we could not see, that the the current was taking us out. All we could see was the heavens. Now, I knew that it was taking too long, and I was praying. Not far from us was a yacht. So there she is pacing back and forth, as we do when we see something that is fearful, and we cry out, Oh, Lord, have mercy. There's nothing she could do. Screaming, yelling wouldn't help. We just sat there, we were talking, and we were flip-flopping, just swimming backwards, looking toward the sky. It was a beautiful sunny day, and we realized that something is not working here. Eventually, because God knew, that yacht pulled up anchor, (laughs) and, and he sailed over to us. He goes, you guys need a lift? Oh, thank you. He pulled us close to the shore. So here's the point. We were in imminent danger. I was aware somewhat, but my eyes were to the sky. Her eyes were to the danger and the probabilities that she would lose her husband and son. And she's crying and praying and, Lord, do something and fretting, dealing with that fear. How do you deal with fear? How quiet do you get when you're really afraid? What do your prayers sound like when it really has to count? You know, you know that when you, when you cry out, Lord, I really mean this. You've got to do something now or else. 
Is there something that can overcome this fear? Well, today we want to hit that practical note where the rubber meets the road, how we can live in this very moment. And I'll tell you, I've been there. I faced death in the eyes, and I've sensed fear, and I cried out to the Lord. I've been there, done that. And I tell you, Scripture and the presence of the Lord. First, there needs to be peace. That's what the angels always said, do not fear, be peaceful. So, as we start this morning, our declaration and the second principle in fighting this fear is that we have a faith overcoming fear. This kind of faith that we're given by the Lord is spiritually infused. It's not having good thoughts. It's not coming up with probabilities, possibilities, and people that can get you out of the circumstance. It is faith in the Lord Jesus, not faith itself, not just being a religious person. It is being planted and anchored on who God is and what Jesus does that gives strength to that fear where you could stand. Faith overcomes fear. As we want to find out these steps, first of all, we need to find out the reality that sometimes God uses fear to unveil who we really are. Because first of all, fear reveals the amount of faith that you have. Fear will reveal how little of faith you do have. It's the one thing that the Lord called the disciples all the time. Oh, you of little faith. Nonstop. And they never got the point. Now, we cannot fight this fear, and we cannot breathe faith through our human natural resources. We go right back to why the call and the challenge is be filled with the Spirit Daily, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's where comes the strength to overcome fear. We see how faith reveals uh, little faith, even when the disciples were dealing with a storm at sea. Now look at Matthew chapter 8, verse 25, and look at the word being, read, word being repeated all the time. Afraid, 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 terrified. As they went and woke him and said, Save us, O Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? In other words, I'm here. What's wrong with you? You're coming to me and you're afraid. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? Look in the mirror when you're afraid and ask yourself, even as David did, Why are you afraid, O oh, my soul? Fear will reveal how much air you got in that tire that you're riding on. Uh, on a funny side, in skydiving, those which are experienced, right? And every time we go up and, and there's people that come to do a first jump, when we hit about 8,000 feet, because the plane is not pressurized, we've got 8,000, 10,000, there's a certain odor that fills the plane because there's pressure and people's bodies are being pressurized, right? And we kind of laugh at that and we call that the smell of fear. Question is, when you're afraid, how do you act? When people look at you, uh, captains on boats know that they can never show fear because if they do, all the sailors lose their minds. So how do you live? How do you act when people look at you and you're afraid? Do you lose your mind? Do you throw it all off board, overboard? Why are you afraid, oh, you of little faith? Then he rose, then he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And then he turned around, so he's talking to them. He says, hold on a second, makes everything at peace. He goes right back to them. And the men marveled, saying, what sort of a man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. Remember when we started the series talking about the woman that came to Elijah and after the fact that first of all he provided food even though she had to give up her last meal and then her son died and then, and then she goes, why have you done this to me? And only after Elijah revives him, brings him back to life, resurrects him, she says, now I know that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. It's the fact of knowing who God is and what he can do. And God will take you, he will unleash 
unleash sometimes fear on you to realize who you are and what it takes to depend on him for him to transform your life. In this case, the disciple says, what kind of a man is this? Even the winds, they did not know. And here it is. We fear when we do not know who God is. We do not know how much he cares. We do not know how involved he is in this nebula, in this darkness, because fear is like a dark cave. Can't find your way out, and all you're thinking is death, destruction, and disaster. Woe is me, and you're paralyzed. What kind of a man is this? Second, we see fear, how little fear Peter had after he walked on the water. We talked a little bit about this last time. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. Circle the word terrified. And they said, oh, it's a ghost. So first of all, they got a storm to worry about. On top of that, now you got a ghost coming at you. You're losing your mind. We're going to die. And they cried out in fear. Now, in today's society, surrounded by your friends and families, you may not cry out, but you cry within, and you close the door, and you're paralyzed, terrified, cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, take heart, it is I, did nothing about the storm yet. His first approach when it comes to fear is, it's me, I am here. That should be the end of the problem. Do not fear, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered, Lord, if it's you, command me to come. And then he came, he walked, and when he saw the wind, he took his eyes off the Lord. He looked at the problems. He looked at the waves. At that point, circle the word, he was afraid and began to sink. And then he cried out, Lord, save me. And then the Lord, in verse 31, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt It's not talking about why are you afraid, you're doubting, you're doubting it is me, you're doubting that I am he, you're doubting that I got control over your situation, I got control over your tumor, I got control over your problems at work, I got control of your retirement, I've got it all under control. You're doubting that I can do what I've promised. Fear gets right in between you and the love of God, not from his perspective, but from yours. And you're doubting that he loves you. Bottom line, that should be an awakening thought. And I would say to myself, how dare I say, do I believe God loves me? Yes, I do. Then shut up and don't worry about it. Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got in the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Here we go again. They realized who he was. Fear comes in and blinds you to really know who Jesus is. And you're embracing the darkness rather to keep your eyes on the Lord. And then we see Jesus teaching them not to be afraid or anxious (coughs) concerning the necessities of life. Look at Luke 12, 27. Listen, guys, look at the lilies of the field. Look at the birds of the air. They neither toil nor spin. I tell you, even Solomon didn't have all this. Know this, that God so loves you. How much more will God clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. And keep this in mind. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't worry about what you're going to have for lunch or what you're going to drink tonight. That was all they lived for back in the day. They worked all day to get the meal for that afternoon. They worked all day to get all the money for that day and the clothing they had. They were not like us. What this means to them in our language is don't worry about your bills. Don't worry about your retirement. Don't worry about your car. Don't worry about any of these things. How much more God cares for you. And every time I'm concerned about my retirement, I'm telling God, I don't believe you got it covered. I think that one day you're going to forget about me. I'm going to wind up under the bridge. And that's Jesus on the cross, having loved me so much, saying, oh, why are you doubting my love? 
faith is revealed when fear knocks at the door. Look at verse 32 of this last passage. Fear not, O little flock. There's not many of you. And I love you. You're, you're just few. I love you. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is the Lord just jumping up and down with joy, knowing that you're going to get so much more. Remember in one other passage, he says, listen, you're going to get a hundred times brothers, sisters, and mothers, and houses. And then on top of this, you're going to get the kingdom of heaven. God cares. Love him. Do not fear. Now, on the positive and the practical, answering the question, why I should not be afraid. We've had several situations in our church recently in health and circumstances. Real reasons for which people should be afraid. Does God have an answer practically for that? A thousand times yes. First of all, keeping in mind that Jesus says, it is I, do not fear. Keeping in mind, I know that God is with you. Keeping in mind, first principle, why we should not fear is because faith rests in the presence of God. Faith does not necessarily give you the solutions or answer the problems right now. You've all been in the situations, and, and some of you may even be in that today, when you get that phone call. I've gotten that phone call. Paul has gotten that phone call. We've been there saying, we want you to come into the office tomorrow. What's the problem? Can't talk to you now. All night long, you're dying and turning. What's going to happen tomorrow? You think of the worst. Doctor calls you in this afternoon. On the way there, you're dying. I want to know now. Faith does not give you that answer. Faith doesn't say, here's the problem, here's the solution, here's the Google map to get out of it. Faith says, embrace the Father. That's the goal of faith. Faith rests in the presence of God. Why? First of all, to get to the point where we can say, now I know. Now I know who my God is. Fear will lie to me. You remember when you were a kid and you had bullies in school? And it was this big, big guy, big old belly, ugly looking mug. And he was surrounded by his groupies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what do you want to do? And he's the one that's coming and yelling at people. And, and you, you cowered away. You had nothing to do with them. But then you learned something from your father. If you are approached encroached by this group of bullies, find out who the big mouth is, and you smack him first. And everybody else runs. You've heard that, right? Because the bully himself is trying to outlive his own fears, whatever they may be, of being accepted, whatever fears he's got at home, whatever he's dealing with, and all these little groupies are afraid of him and not being accepted by others. So they do what they do in their violence. That is fear. Fear is a bully. And as the song says, fear is a liar. Will always constantly fill your head with this tornadoes of thoughts and possibilities and the worst situation that could happen. And you go nuts. And that's why the Lord says, be still in their minds. Do not fear. Okay, I won't fear. Tell me how I'm going to be taken out of this. No, 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 no. Do not be afraid because I'm here. I mean, that's it? Yes. Do not be afraid because I'm here. The three that were thrown in the furnace, they were thrown in a real furnace with flames, and Jesus was there. All that got burned were the ropes that were tying them and set them free. The Lord will use fear to bring you in his presence to set you free for the rest of your life. Know that God, our Father which are in heaven, is personal. Isaiah 41.10. Fear not. And there's no solutions. There's no roadmap. 
The answer is, fear not. I am with you. Period. That's enough. But he goes on. Don't be dismayed. In other words, don't let your head spin looking at all the possibilities and all the waves and the darkness of the cave. Don't be dismayed. I am your God. Not just a friend, not just, not just a word, but I'm a God, all powerful, and I am with you. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to strengthen you from within, and I will help you. Every single little child runs to daddy if they're being chased by a chihuahua or a rottweiler, and they jump up in daddy's arms, and daddy can take care of it. How much more our eternal father? Every single one of us has stories that we could list saying, I was so afraid, I saw my life being dismembered, and I feared, and I wondered, and I prayed, and I, I, thro- I, I was so afraid for nothing. For I woke up the next morning, God took care of it. Fear is wasted energy on imagined possibilities. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. I am directly involved. Our Father is personal. And so much more, our Father is present. He is not on the other side of the world. He is God, omnipresent. He is involved with you as if you were the only person on this planet. He is with you. Joshua 1, 9 Moses is dead, the the leader, the visionary, the powerful, the one that strikes the rock or speaks to the rock, the one that does all that is gone. Joshua, what do I do? God says, I commanded you. In other words, I came up with a plan. I know the roadmap. I am the one that is sending you. Have I not commanded you? In other words, like Jesus said, you believe in Father, believe also in me. I go to prepare your place. If I did not, I would have told you so. So Joshua, I commanded you. I'm not just talking. I know what I'm doing. God is present. Be strong, be courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed. Notice that you have dismayed always following fright. Once fear comes in and you open the door, you allow it to sit down and it gathers roots, you'll be dismayed. In other words, you will lose control not knowing what to do next. You won't have the strength to think, to plan, to trust, to call, to pray. You'll be dismayed. You can't listen to anybody because you allowed fear to settle in. Do not be dismayed. Why? For the Lord, your God, is with you. That's the name Emmanuel that became a man and lived among us to be with you in your circumstance. He's with you anywhere you go. And Jesus said that, go into all the world and behold, I am with you. He is personal. He is present. I should say amen, and we go home rejoicing, but you're too afraid. He's also our provider. Practically, God will take care and promises to provide all that you need. It is the Father's good pleasure. He is like a father and a mom buying a gift for Christmas and like me, you can't wait till Christmas. You want to give it now to see how happy the child is. That's God. He is a provider. Look at Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares, your anxieties on him. Every single one. Name them. We'll talk about this later. It's very important when fear comes, you speak out so you can hear yourself what that fear is because the truth will set you free. Fear lies. Fear shuts your mouth. Fear pushes you into a corner. But when you speak, you say, Jesus, here are my worries. And as you sometimes hear yourself say what you're saying, you say, really? That's ridiculous. Speak out your fears to the Lord. Cast your anxieties on Him. Why? Well, it is my calling in life. I thrive on this. Not just a job. I live to carry burdens, 
but not like the Lord Jesus. But here's what the world says. Calling Paul to tell him my problems won't really help because can't do much about it. Some people don't want to hear other people's problems. Some people don't care about your problems. Jesus does. Cast all your cares. Why? Because he cares for you. Psalm 55, 22. Cast your burdens on the Lord. And if you do that, because he cares, he will sustain you. He'll hold you up. He will never let the righteous fall. And that's a prayer. You'll call out, Lord Jesus, you've promised me that if I give you my cares, my worries, I'm going to cast these on you, Lord. It is up to you now to hold me because you promised I'll never fall. And God says, yes. Never says, eh, I'll think about it. No, yes. We're taught to speak back the word to him. And that thrills his heart. That is living by faith. He is our provider, not just that. He is our protector. He provides. He's present. He's personal. But He protects you. He promises. Look at all these verses. Say to those who are anxious as heart, raise your hand. Yes, that's us. Be strong and fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. He will recompense the recompense of God. He will come and save you against your enemies, against your fears, against the demons. God comes and He wants to come and He will sustain and save you with vengeance. And he promises us in his ever presence, God's eyes, scripture says in Chronicles, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. He's looking over the whole world and he's looking for something. What is he looking for? To give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Trust him. Repent before him. Present your weakness before him. And he's looking for you to give you strong support. Isaiah 43, 3 says, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Don't forget who He is. This Father that draws near you is the Almighty God. You're not just crying out to an idol. I watched this just the other day. The story came out about the 13 boys, the soccer players in Thailand. They got trapped into this cave for so many days, and they couldn't get them out. And I'm watching all the people worshiping these idols and lighting candles to these idols and images. And I'm crying out how much of the world is in darkness before stones. We have a God that is all-powerful, the, the true, real, almighty Jehovah. Listen, he says, as I protect you, though I am the almighty God, I'm going to give Egypt as your ransom. I'm going to give people in, as a ransom in exchange for you because I love you. Talking to the Israelites, how much more does he love the Lord's bride? And he cherishes you. He will protect you. Look what he does for Israel. How much more for us? I give Egypt as a ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you because you are precious in my eyes. When God the Father looks at you, his, there's a sparkle in his eyes when he sees you and honored. And here's what God says, I love you. And you have this midget, good for nothing fear come and yap away, biting in your ankles. And you run away from this chihuahua fear as if it was a lion. When God says, I love you. I give men in return for you. Peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not. I am with you, present. I will bring forth your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you, he provides. Not only does he come to your help, not only is he present and protects you, but he charges his angels 
on a full-time mission to encamp around you. They placed their tents of war around your life, around your house. Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he delivers them. Do not fear because of the presence of God. And if that was enough, there's so much more. Do not fear through the words of Jesus is our second pillar on which we choose to build this foundation of faith against fear. Faith rises from the words of Jesus. And in looking at these, we look at what the Lord says, and he takes care of all the aspects of your life, of what you have been dealing with, and what you may be dealing with. The Lord says something that breathes life into you to trust him. And the faith comes when you believe what he says. Because if... When I am afraid, I'm saying that God doesn't love me. At the same time, when I'm afraid, I'm saying Jesus is a liar. Oh no, I would never do that. What are you thinking? First of all, Jesus, he talks about and he takes care of the fear of life. Anything in your life. Anything that comes in a tax, the Lord talks, listen, do not be afraid. Jesus promised, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Like God promised Joshua, right? I commanded you, be strong, courageous, do not be frightened, do not be dismayed. Whatever you deal with, and God having known you when he was on the cross, and having known you before you were created, he knows your life, planned out your life. He knows what circumstances will come. And he says, I'm going to be with you through every single one. The Lord promised, do not fear what comes in life. Why? Because he's at our side. Look at Hebrews 13, 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Why is the love of money the root of all evil? Because money, when you love it, it wants to present itself as God. You have enough money, you got nothing to worry about the law. You got good enough lawyers, do whatever you want, you'll be set free. You got enough money, you have always food to eat, places to sleep. No worries about retirement, no worries about bills. You got money, so money is all that you have that promises to replace what God can do. And that's why the Lord approaches this and attacks it. Keep yourself free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. It is not the things, it's the presence. It's the presence of the Lord that satisfies. And then he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Because money, it it will be eaten by the moth and stolen by the thief. But God says, I will never leave you. The idea is that I will not walk away busy with other things or forsake you more directly. In other words, I know what you've done. I've had enough. I'm turning my back on you. And that's why Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken so that you would not be. He took all that weight, all that judgment. And God says, I will never forsake you. These are the words of Jesus. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord gives us the words of life when it deals to life, to defeat fear in life. Well, let's talk about poverty. You guys fear poverty. If you were honest, would you raise your hand and say that you fear poverty? Yeah. We all have that place under the bridge, don't we? We're thinking about that tent, the Walmart plan. Get the tent and go live on the beach. Does God care about where you're going to live? Well, look at what David says. In his time, thousands of years ago, but with eternal power. I have been young and now I'm old. Yet... I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. 
we see all these people that are homeless and you wonder how they got there. Who are they? And I've talked to them. And with every single one of them, I'm trying to understand this verse. Has God failed this guy? And you hear all about, yeah, I've accepted Jesus a hundred times at Pacific Garden Mission and all of these different stories. And yeah, I grew up in, but none of the people that I've met so far, and I've met so many that are homeless, would have come across to me saying, I walk with the Lord. And like Job, God took everything. I've never seen that. God will use homeliness to bring people on their knees and repentance to come before the Lord. David promises all of my life. God has never forsaken them or their children. And that's why Jesus says, don't be anxious about your life. What should I not be anxious about? Don't be anxious about what you're going to eat or drink, about your body, what you're going to put on. Isn't life more than food and all these things you're running about? Talks about the birds and he says, are you not of more value than them? Yes, the Gentiles run after these things. But the Father knows that you need them all. The Gentiles don't know that God cares, so they want to grab and provide and not share because they think they're going to lose it all. They don't know the Father cares. Jesus promises we have nothing to fear when it comes to even poverty. You know, pastors live on that edge at sometimes because if you think in a secular fleshly kind of thing you depend on the church and many pastors have compromised what they preach how they preach so they won't lose their job right to maintain the budget and hold it oh the lord knows how many times he asked me to stand and give it all away because he is my provider he is your provider Not to compromise, not to please, be faithful, be blameless in his sight. You have nothing to fear. Oh, yes, Jesus talks about the fear of death, the words of Christ. The word of God talks about the fear of death, that he himself has defeated fear, Hebrews 2.14. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Jesus, likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery, slaves to fear of death. Jesus says, I am life, eternal life, and I hold the keys of hell and Hades. That's why we could say like Paul, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means the fruitful labor for me. Yet I shall choose, what I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Do not fear. If you have Christ, your death is not death. It's a passage to final salvation, redemption, and eternity. Nothing to fear. And I'm going to skip to some practical steps. If we overcome and we believe what Jesus tells us about eternal life, and salvation from death through death. Why should we fear all these petty things that we call worldly needs? They have no value. Here are six things that you must not do, and seven that you must. I'm going to just run through them. Today, as you fear what's going to happen tomorrow, here's what you must not do. First of all, do not despair. Do not be dismayed. Don't sink in this abyss of the worst possible outcomes. Like the Israelites. Oh, it would have been better in Egypt. We're going to die in the desert. What do we do now? We want to die. Do not despair. Say in the name of Jesus, heart, stop. Call upon the name of Jesus and stop your fear right there. No explanation. Just say no in the name of Jesus. I'm not going to despair. Second, do not question and blame God. All right? Like Job's wife. 
all good and, and blame, you know, uh, blaspheme God and curse God and die already. Why are you going through all these struggles? Do not question and blame God. In other words, do not question as if, why me? Why now? You don't love me. It's okay to ask, Lord, what are we dealing with? Not the questioning that doubts God. Do not question and blame God. Like the Israelites, here's the Red Sea, there is uh, the Pharaoh coming, we see the dust getting closer. It's your fault, Moses, it's God's fault. Why do we leave Egypt? Uh, pickles were much better. Why? Don't question and don't blame God. Third, don't start vibrating and bouncing off the walls looking for solutions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to call there. I'll go from this card to that card. I'm going to call this. No, no, no. Stop that. That's not the time. Now it's time for faith in battle against fear. Do not start looking for a thousand solutions. Like Nebuchadnezzar, when he was told that this is it. You will go into, into, into the wilderness for seven seasons. He's losing his mind. I'm going to lose all that I've got. What do I do? Or Pharaoh, after the Israelites are gone, he lost his workforce, and I let them go. What am I going to do? He gets the army to go for a swim. Chariots don't swim that good. Don't try to come up with your own solutions. Fourth, don't compromise your faith. Don't compromise your walk with the Lord in trying to find solutions. Well, you know what? It's better to ask forgiveness than permission. So I'm going to cheat this time. I'm going I'm to lie this time just so I can get out and say, Lord, forgive me I did that. Do not compromise in finding sinful solutions. When Saul lo lost the presence of the Lord, and he was not getting any leadership and guidance in battle, no prophet would talk to him. What did he do? He went to the witch. I'm going to find out. I know I shouldn't. I'm the one that cast him out. God told him to cast him out. I'm going to find one witch. I'm going to ask her what to do. Do not try to find solutions by compromising. Stand like those three in front of the furnace and say, even if we will not be delivered, we will not bow. Fifth, do not give up on God. We start with, it's my wife's fault, my son's fault, my friend's fault. It's my, it's my fault. No, it's God's fault. I'm done with God. I'm going to walk away. That's exactly what the enemy, Satan, and fear wants to get from you ultimately. And that's what Saul did as he was defeated. He surrenders to failure. He falls on his sword and says, okay, God rejected me. I'm done. Do not give up on God. Sixth, do not give up on life. God did not breathe life into you for you to snuff it out like Judas. Peter went out and he wept in repentance. Judas went out and he wept in sorrow and because he was sorry, but not repentance. And he hung himself. Do not give up on life because God loves you. He's got your situation under control much more. He has you in his arms and he is guiding and walking through you with you as you surrender to him. So what must we do? All right. A little bit psychological, pragmatic, a little bit logical. Assess your situation at hand. Write things on paper. Grab those thoughts that are swirling in your mind and write them on paper. One, I'm afraid of, and put it down. Assess the situation with open eyes and clear mind, but do it in the light of eternity. <clears throat> All right, so you got to go to court next week because you got a ticket three weeks ago and your world's about to implode because you're afraid of the cops and the, and the judge. What are you going to do? And say, okay, what's that got to do with spending infinity in paradise?
paradise with the Lord in the beauty and majesty of the new Jerusalem. I can't wait. This has got nothing, no weight whatsoever. Assess the situation at hand in the light of eternity. Assess it in the light of God's will. The fact that he has been involved with you, gave you birth in the nation where he gave you birth, to the family he gave you birth to, to the school that you went to, to the life you've been living, the fact that he met you on the road of Damascus and gave you eternal life, that's his will of life for you for eternity. Put that in light to whatever situation you're dealing with. Assess it with a clear spiritual simplicity. Assess it with God's fingerprints And all the steps of his love for you to the present. Second, separate fact from fiction. Write down what you got, what you're dealing with. Do not deal with what may happen, what the possible outcomes are, and differentiate the lies and the screaming of the enemy of what could happen, what fear is saying is a lie. I'm not charismatic, but the devil is a liar, and so is fear. Write that down. Separate fact from fiction. Thirdly, Paul's favorite tells me all the time, be still and know that he's God. Remember who he is, what he has done, his power, his majesty, and the fact that he still gets down on one knee and talks to you, looking you right into the eyes. Be still, relax, be at peace, breathe. Don't listen to your fear. Be still and know that he's God. Fourth, pray. Pray. Specifically, especially, out loud in your room, in your closet, in your car, pray. Say, Father, here's what I'm dealing with. I've been feeling this here for quite a while. I don't want to go, but if I go, Lord, I, Lord I'm going to die. And God says, great, come on up. What are you afraid of? Pray. Fifthly, if you're still taking water and you can't bail it out enough, increase your scripture reading. Be in the book, read the Psalms, read Gospel of John, read Ephesians, read Philippians, read, read all of these epistles that breathe life of how you should live, Colossians. Increase your spiritual intake. The more fear comes to you, the more read the Bible. I guarantee you fear is going to stop talking because he doesn't want you to read the Bible. It's an adverse effect from the enemy. So when he comes, oh, you're here again? Let me read some more Psalms. Sixthly, godly counsel. You need to nurture. You need to surround yourself with godly people that can speak to you from the Lord through the word, that can encourage you. Do you have godly counsel? Do you have godly men and women that you can talk to and share these things? Stop being so American. I'm fine. You're fine. Let's move on. I won't share. Open your heart to godly people and tell them how you feel and speak it out because the enemy doesn't want you to open your mouth as you fellowship in prayer to receive encouragement. Godly people that won't tell you, don't worry, everything will be okay. No, those that open scripture and say, here's what it says in Psalm 20, how God is with you. 23, he is your shepherd. 37, do not be dismayed. No, he's God. Walk with him. Godly counsel. And lastly, wait on the Lord. Don't try to just find a solution so you can put it to bed. Wait on the Lord. Because even through your circumstance of fear, the Lord is working on your life. He's molding you. He's shaping you. He's slicing away that fat. He's strengthening away those muscles. It is good for you to be under God's furnace because he's got the control of that temperature. Wait on the Lord. Don't pull that pie out of the oven before it's time because it's no good. Stay there until the Lord redeems and takes you out. Feed your faith, said someone, and all your fears will start starve to death. Someone else said, fear knocks at the door. Faith answered, and no one was there. Faith 
in Jesus. This relationship. And when you come out at the end of the struggle, you find that you will say, now I know that you are the Lord Almighty God. And you know what's going to happen then? You won't be able to keep quiet and telling people what God has done in your life. That's what David says. I will cry out among the congregation of all the things you've done in your redemption in my life. When you come out of this, Satan would have failed because fear has not paralyzed or killed you off. You know the Lord God who is present who provides, who protects, who is personal to take care of anything in this life, anything in eternity, anything even through death. Heavenly Father, it is good to rest at your feet to receive the breath of the Holy Spirit, for we will not be afraid. We will not even fear fear itself. Because we know that Jesus, you are here. And we know that our Father cares for us so much more, has provided how much more, all this is increasing our love and trust and strength to be lights and salt in this generation. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.